Hello all, welcome back to our Data Science Learning Channel Book Club for Mastering Shiny. As you can see on the screen, we are going to venture into chapter 11, which is about a concept called bookmarking. And before I forget, I want to thank the folks in the previous cohorts for making some excellent slides for us to continue along in this journey. Reading off what we have in front of us. In brief, Bookmarking addresses the issue of not being able to expose the current state of the app in its URL. At first, your Shiny app cannot be bookmarked or share a specific place with others. That is to say, when you're working with the Shiny app, playing around with all the interactive tools as a user, it might get to a point where you want to share a specific image or result with your colleagues. What we're going to do today is, is explore how to set a bookmark so that way you could share that exact same state of information with your colleagues. The skills involved, as you can see in the learning objectives, include adding the bookmark button. Oddly enough, we're going to make the user interface, the UI, into a function. And then in the Shiny app, call to run the overall app, we're going to explore the enable bookmarking parameter. So once again, bookmarking is a way for a user to be able to conveniently return to a specific state of the Shiny app. Thinking about this in a more technical point of view, reading the paragraph in the middle. As it stands, Shiny apps are what are called single page applications, SPAs. A web application or website that interacts with the user by dynamically rewriting the current web page with new data from the web server. However, in the point of view of the this per current chapter, this was one of the major drawbacks of employing Shiny apps. It is super inconvenient for you and your stakeholders to have to input the exact parameters in your application to produce the results that you're trying to share. In other words, when we think about reporting the data to our colleagues and we think about reproducibility, we rarely want to get to a point where we have to tell people a sequence of button clicks or steps to proceed. We want to have a place where we can share code with them, share apps with them, and not to ask them to do too much more overhead at that point. Looking back at the bottom of the slide, now with bookmarking functionality, this problem is addressed. The example that the textbook author presents to us comes from the world of geometry. Excuse me if I'm advanced if I'm mispronouncing this, but we are going to look at Lisa Drew's curves. And what they are is they trace the motion of a pen pendulum, at least in the XY two-dimensional plane. The video is not loading here, and I'm meant to load the video at first, just for the sake of civility, I'm gonna stop sharing just for a minute here. So we're looking at these Lisa Drew's curves and in the periodic motion of it all, depending on this, the speed frequency period that you have in each dimension, you could produce these different images. Thus, as we've seen in previous chapters, when you have a situation where different images might be 
valuable to you, it might be better to make a shiny app or some sort of dashboard to be able to ex explore the space, so to speak. Folks that want more information about the mathematical side of this could, of course, go to the Wikipedia entry or else or other resources. There are main, three main parts you must modify in a Shiny app in order for it to be bookmarkable. In the user interface, we, one, need to make it a function. Two, add the bookmark button function. And three, in the Shiny app call itself, we're going to include the enabling bookmarking URL. Looking at most of the code for the Shiny app, here we have our usual inter user interface, but notice that we are going to make this a function and overall have a request as the input. Amongst the user element, the user interface elements, we should have a bookmark button to be able to request the action to take place. So we have this interactive button that we'll see in the app. And then finally, in the Shiny app call, in addition to the usual user interface and server, we have this additional parameter that will enable bookmarking and we'll see that the bookmarks will affect the URLs. Now for each of these steps, we should probably think about this a little more deeply, a little more into the technical details. So when we say make it a function, here's some of the reasoning. It's because Shiny needs to be able to modify the input controls specified by the URL. Like when we pass arguments within normal R functions as parameters to produce different results, the user interface now needs to take an argument, namely the URL, in order to return the app into a particular state. The URL holds the information on the input parameters that need to be changed, and hence why the user interface now needs to be a function. Uh, restated, first of all, I forgot to mention that URLs, uh, as folks in this audience know, are the web page addresses, URLs standing for a uniform research locator for the internet purposes. We are going to have the URLs contain the inputs for what we want the Shiny app to do. Secondly, we have our bookmark button. This function adds a button to the user interface that captures the current values of all the input controls and generates a URL from, from it. We'll see that in a, in a bit. We'll run through the, the app itself on the next slide. And then finally, the additional parameter at the end. This function ultimately puts the app together, the user interface and the server. Adding this argument tells Shiny to enable bookmarking and that the bookmark will be URL encoded and versus saved on server. As we proceed through the hour, we will demonstrate both of these functionalities. The textbook author once again provides a, an example of a Shiny app on, on their servers. So we could go ahead and test out this app. Before I forget, I didn't did not show the server code. So just in case anybody's curious, here is the server code. Most of it is the underlying mathematics, the trigonometry involved for this context. And then um, Another chunk, of course, is to render the plot as usual.
So with this, we could change the parameters in the trigonometric functions, and we could see if it affects the least Jews curves a bit. When you're dealing with parametric equations, you also need to tell the mathematical system how long you want your vectors to be. So you could change that as well. Oops, I meant that down here. The default settings, of course, produce some pretty nice images already. Now, the idea is once I get to a state where I feel that the image might be useful to share, I could click this bookmark button and a pop-up will appear that will allow me to get a longer URL. Now, the hope is if I share this URL, it'll load up the app and get us right back to the exact same state, namely the same values on our input sliders and input selection box at the moment. And of course, if I change up the parameters a bit, the URL will change as well to include that information. The folks in the previous cohort extended this discussion a bit and I really like what they did with this slide here. A default URL that is generated from within a Shiny app will look something like this. This is what we saw. Or if you're running the app locally on your own computer, you might see a URL that looks more like this just to handle the local address rather than an extended website address. But you'll notice that otherwise, the additional inputs and parameters are structured the same. Folks that are more versed with internet technologies realize that the first part, the HTTPS is part of the protocol. The next part uh, labeled in the reddish color is the location of the app which may be on a server and then a directory. And for today, we are focused on what is highlighted there in the bluish color. We are focused on the parameters. So you can see that we have the inputs leading into the parameters that are denoted by the ampersands and the mathematical parameters include the damping, the delta, the length, and the omega. We are already about halfway or maybe more through this session. I just wanted to take a breather and ask folks in the audience if they have any further questions or discussion on these matters. All good. So the folks who use these technologies they quickly realize that sending one URL to, from one person to it, another might be convenient at first, but like with a lot of computer programming, if you're going to do something repeatedly, this might not be so practical. So it is probably more convenient to have the URL just update itself whenever the inputs change rather than having the user press the button each time a state must be captured. In the code, 
we will automatically update bookmark every time the user input changes. So we're going to make an observable state. Um, apologies if I'm not quite getting the jargon right. We'll do these two steps, which I'll explain in just a second at the bottom of the slide. And then we'll also update the query string, namely update the URL that contains the parameters. Where this goes is inside the server function now. So once again, we have the mathematics, we have the render plot, and now on the server side, we will do those steps, automatically bookmark every time the input changes and update the query string. To talk about this more technically, and once again, I want to thank the folks in the previous cohorts for, for this discussion. This step, we read it off as reactive values to this. For the most part, it's analogous to a type conversion to this that you would see elsewhere in the R programming language. We're taking the reactive object, namely the input, and storing its values and dependencies in a list. So that's this part here. Now for do bookmark, you can see that's a method on the session object. More technically, it invokes the on bookmark callback function from the session object. A callback function itself is a function that is passed as an argument to another function that is, is going to be called back at a later time. A function that accepts other function as argument is called a higher order function, and it contains the logic for when the callback function gets executed. So it's a bit deeper when you start to dissect uh, how this information flow occurs. A session object is an environmental is an environment that can be used to access information and functionality relating to the session. I had a typo here. This should say refined app going into this slide. So you'll notice on the image, if nothing else, at the bottom left, we actually no longer have the bookmark button, at least in the image. Let's see how this plays out on the app. I uh, spoke too soon. We do have the bookmark button. Where we could grab the bookmark if we wanted to. But uh, this may be a bit small on the monitor screen. What we're looking at is at this URL up here, apologies for the drop-down menu. So you'll notice when I mess with the parameters, the URL is indeed changing to keep up with the updates to the information. Now, folks who work in data science teams, they might want even more functionality for this. So what they were thinking was that URL bookmarking is simple and works everywhere. You may want to deploy your Shiny app. However, this could become very long if you have a large number of inputs. 
if this is the case, it may be better to store your state on the server side. So what we're thinking is we're going to ask Shiny to save the state of the app in an RDS uh, data file on the server and generate maybe a shorter and easier URL because at this point, you actually do not need it to be human readable. To do this, you could simply change the enable bookmarking argument to be server instead of URL. So changing this to this. And what will generate all URLs that look like this, a protocol, app location, and then finally, the state ID is encoded in kind of a hash key. The parameter in this instance is a state ID, which corresponds to a directory in your working directory. I'll come back to this footnote in just a, a minute, but let me see if I could just run this app on my own computer. So here you can see I copy and pasted the wonderful code for the user interface, the server, and the app call. It, noting in particular at the end, we have updated the enable bookmarking parameter to go to towards focusing on the server side rather than the URL explicit information. Now for this app, I just have it stored somewhere on my computer. I'm gonna press the run app button. It loads the app and you can see on the right hand side, the Shiny framework has now produced a Shiny bookmarks subdirectory which may come in handy. And we have a hash key here. Now, as I update the app by playing around with the interactive elements, namely the parameters, the slider inputs, you'll notice on the right-hand side, additional states are saved. So that way in the revision history sense, I could go back to any of these states if I load the proper files. Moreover, if we needed to be very careful in an exploratory workflow, we could send all these states to a colleague or at least keep all this information in a shared server in our organization. Now, as the textbook and the slides said, for each one of these hash key coded states, what it contains is an input file of the RDS uh, data type that uh, the software can, of course, read. I'm gonna just take a quick aside to see if I can open that RDS file. I just, I'm gonna stop sharing screen for just a second. Okay, so reading that RDS file, very straightforward. And 
I just left the default naming. We have this as the input object. And we could see, at least on an elementary level, that the input object contains the mathematical parameters that we have been exploring during this book club session. You have noticed that as I was playing around with those parameters, what was going on in my server-side files was that this was creating a new file for every single instance that I was making, really. So the textbook and the folks in the previous cohorts were con understandably concerned about that, especially if you have larger apps that might be dealing with many input parameters. So a note on the, the cautionary tale about the memory is that you might wanna be sure to have a mechanism to routinely delete these directories. If your app requires bookmarking in a complex state and you do not delete these files, your app is gonna take up more disk space and may start to lag. However, when you do delete these files, their corresponding URLs will also stop working. Just be sure to either send updated links to stakeholders or be mindful of the state of your app. That was most of the chapter. We will uh, start going towards a conclusion by just mentioning some further thoughts that for folks that are interested in this bookmarking uh, tool when building your Shiny apps, here are some additional ideas that might come to mind. You must be extra cautious if your app relies on random number generation. Bookmarking will not generate the same results unless you make the process reproducible. You'll notice in the URLs and the parameters that we passed so far, there was no notion of making or setting a random seed. So one suggestion is there is a repeatable wrapper function that will always use the same seed when called. For example, if you call the rnorm function, generating random numbers from a normal distribution, you could wrap that in a repeatable function and that will help address the reproducibility in wanting to have the exact same results. Last week, Umer gave a great example of an app where when you're loading the app, you might not want all the information showed all at once, uh, especially if you have like a login system for your organization you might have a version of this. So you might want to have people that are loading the app from the URL that you give them. You could tell them exactly which tab that will load first or load to be visible by default at the moment. And you could adjust the tabs that panel thereof. Thinking of in that realm, if you do have an organization where you do have confidential information, be cautious of what you share. If your app requires sensitive information, you could set your bookmark to exclude information somewhere in the server to ensure that they do not get included in your bookmark. And this set bookmark exclude can take a list of, of of objects, a list of names of the objects. And then finally, if you use reactive values to manually manage the reactive state, there's a subtle difference to using on bookmark versus using on bookmark. Of uh, folks that are delving 
into this level of technicality into the Shiny apps, we'll notice that the information they need is not necessarily in this textbook, in this printing at the moment. However, there are blog posts, or sorry, uh, more information will be reviewed later. But to, in addition, there are blog posts found on the Shiny documentation. And in particular, we could move on to advanced bookmarking. And there is more information here to address the subtle need for on bookmark versus on bookmarked and other notions in that realm. Um, I have an example that I'd like to share, uh, which uses advanced bookmarking, uh, and it uses uh, a somewhat newer layout that VSLIP package provides. Uh, yes, go ahead. Share my screen. So uh, let's first look at the app. So in this case, I'm trying to create multiple tabs using uh, accordion panels with VSLIP. So my first tab would be named as first. And then there's the second one. So with this, we have uh, these two panels. And in each of them, we have uh, two text inputs. So I can say, for example, one and two for these. And if you notice here, uh, this is the uh, URL bookmarking. And we can restore these. Uh, if I, for example, refresh, I'll come back to the same data. But I was trying to do something like this and it was very challenging uh, with the uh, bookmark button and only the on bookmark option, on bookmarked option. So I found um, one answer on Stack Workflow that deals with this. And So here, um, this is the solution to that uh, question. So here we have uh, accordion panels that are created using this accordion function from the VSLIP package. And then here we use the uh, on bookmark and on restore uh, options within Shiny. So this is just uh, the server part for updating new accordion panels within a given accordion. So in our example, there were two tabs that I created. So this is exactly what's uh, generating those two. And to restore them, I first have uh, this uh, to bookmark as before. And uh, then there's this function on bookmark and inside we uh, define which part of the app we want to bookmark. So uh, we use the state and within that we specify that we want to uh, create a new value called tabs, which should be equal to the tabs uh, that I am generating here. So the tabs in this case is the reactive value and this could be any number of tabs as we saw in the app. So that is what I am specifying as what should be bookmarked. And then when we want to restore that, uh, here I use the for loop because there could be more than one tabs. And then I use the function accordion panel insert from VSLIP to 
insert the, that tab back in the app when it is uh, restored. At the end, again, it's on bookmarks, update queries as before. So this is a relatively small example, but for complicated apps where you are generating uh, UI dynamically uh, like this, uh, own bookmark and on restore functions are easy to work with, and you can then get back the state of the app. Yes, thank you. That is quite exciting. Yeah. You mentioned I that it's a of... relatively larger app, but I quickly found out that if you have modules also, then it becomes really challenging to, to do this. But it's still useful for relatively smaller apps. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, excuse my ignorance. So when you say that the modules and maybe the accordion tabs uh, presented a challenge, uh, what were the challenges involved? Because with modules, as we'll see later in the book, um, there are uh, namespaces and uh, we don't want to use, uh, for example, as we know now, we have IDs for each UI element and we do not want to use the same ID name. With a module that we want to repeat, for example, a value box that we want to gen generate in our uh, dashboard, we may have multiple value boxes and we want to have them using the same theme or same style or same font color, for example. So we want to then write a module that will represent that value box and then repeat that and inside the module, we can give it any name. So it is useful to repeat things uh, to create a module, but when you are using bookmarking with a module, then it comes with challenges because then you have to use that namespace in which a given instance of the module is created. So it then becomes very challenging to figure out, okay, what was the namespace I'm using? and what is the ID that I'm providing in the main part of the server. So there it becomes more and more challenging if the app is fairly complicated. Yes, indeed. I myself am just dreading the prospects of that, but also excited about what we can do with the dynamic UI that you all started presenting a, a week or two ago. And then of course the modules that we're all looking forward to. Okay, Mayor, is there anything else that you wanted to discuss today? No, all good. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, folks, we will see you.